sit night after night watching our story play through my head. One where she returns at last to my arms, for I have known and been loved by the perfect woman. When M. Butterfly, David Henry Huang's groundbreaking play based on the real-life romance between a married French diplomat and a mysterious Chinese opera singer opened on Broadway in 1988, it won the Tony Award for Best Play and ran for nearly two years. Now, 30 years later, it's receiving its first Broadway revival in a gorgeous production directed by Julie Taymor and starring Clive Owen and Jin Ha. It's at the Court Theater on West 48th Street, and I'm delighted that it has brought Julie Taymor and David Henry Huang uh, to the Jerome L. Green space and back to our show. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> David, it's taken nearly 30 years to bring this play back to Broadway. Were you waiting to find the right moment, the right <laughs> stars, the right director? I mean, I guess in retrospect, I was not in a, in a big hurry to bring it back because um, many shows that were successful in the 80s have been revived subsequently. And um, I think that, you know, 30 years ago, we were very fortunate to have a show that people talked about a lot, that, uh, that incited its own discussions and controversy, and which engaged with the culture. And I just thought, well, how do we do that again? Uh, and I think it was really when uh, Julie came into the picture that I began to think of this would be a way to have a, a very fresh, new M. Butterfly. Well, the issues that uh, are brought up in the play are are very real today as well. Yeah, I mean, certainly um, we are, there's a line in the play, um, Orientals will always submit to a greater force, okay? <laughs> and although um, the power balance between the U.S. and China has shifted radically in the last 30 years, uh, we happen to be at a moment right now where, um, you know, we have a president who's feeling that the way you deal with Asia is to be um, more aggressively masculine and forceful. And so I think we're sort of in a, you know, m make America and butterfly uh, again, moment. <laughs> Julie, first, congratulations on the 20th anniversary of The Lion King, Thank you. which has now been seen by 90 million people in 24 <laughs> productions and <laughs> gross almost $8 billion. Uh, has that incredible success given you the freedom to choose projects that Absolutely. you care about? That's, I don't do anything unless I have a passion for it. I'm one of the lucky ones. What brought you to M. Butterfly? Is it a play that you'd had your eye on for a while? No, not at all. I've never done a revival except for Shakespeare, which I don't think we technically <laughs> call those revivals. But uh, it, I, I love David. We had talked years ago about doing an opera together. I had seen the play 30 years ago and had not strong, but th th there were images and, and experiences of it that I remembered. But David knows this now, but I wasn't really that eager to do it partly for the reason he said, I thought it might be dated. And uh, even though I loved the idea of it, what prompted me not to turn it down was to look at the, at the research that came out after David wrote the play. Joyce Wadler, who had written that article that David uh, based this on, a very short article, page 27, right, of the oh, New York Times? Yeah. Yes, I've heard that now. Well, a couple of paragraphs. <clears throat> Yeah, but afterwards, uh, based on his success, uh, there was m more people went over and interviewed the real people, and the real story came out, and I was just shocked by it, and I, I don't know if we're supposed to ruin it for people, but I guess, spoiler, it's already been done in papers uh, and this I, and that. I think people... Know un it? Unfortunately, there are a few spoilers in the world these days. Yes, there are. Well, well what happens in, in that is different from David's original. In the original... Yeah, you, how much have you rewritten? Oh, a lot. He's rewritten mm. a lot. I mean, it's hard to, it's sort of hard to c put a number on it, mm. but I would say that, you know, we, the old version really turned a lot on um, the surprise reveal. Uh, so, was, as I might as well say, it's, you know, the French diplomat has a 20-year affair with a Chinese actress who turns out to be uh, what we would now call physically male, and the diplomat claimed that he never knew the true gender of his lover. So that was the true story um, that I read on page 27. It wasn't actually Joyce Wadler who wrote the original oh. New York Times article, but anyway. Um, and so the... Um, 
in the original play, it turned a lot on the reveal that Sung mm. was physically male. And in that way, it was more similar to, say, The Crying Game, which came out a few years later, after M. Butterfly, I want to say. Um, but, um, you know, we felt like that, that shock wouldn't be as, um, as, as sensational um, 30 years ago, because we know so much more and are such, so much more comfortable with different forms of gender expression. But that gave us the opportunity to look at the relationship more deeply. And um, I would say that the, that's the biggest change in uh, between the two versions. Yes, and also I think that David, it's a very uh, personal drama but also political and David's interest was always in the political. The personal I felt was not as developed in the original. So when I came on I said to David, I think that this love story has to go deeper and that we need to get into Song, the Chinese diva's uh, whole being, and, and why does he, she do the mm. things that she does? We can't just say it's a betrayal, it's an espionage, and it's a revenge story. Now it's not. The betrayal goes always. The, the, it's not really a revenge story. It has the political, but the love story between these two individuals is so much deeper than it was in the original that I think the audience really gets uh, both points of view. It's not just the white man story. The song is uh, based on a, a man named Shi Pei Pu, Correct. a singer from the Beijing Opera. We should point out that the story uh, is uh, based on the true life case of this French diplomat, Bernard Borisco. Uh, it turns out she was a spy for the Chinese government. Yes, that was besides the fact of being male. Uh, and and was, was his spying. mission to seduce Borisco to get, get him to divulge secrets about French military plans? I mean, I think there there is. You're shaking your head, no, Julie. No, I, it, oh, well, okay. There's. Um, it's not really clear no, yeah. when um, the uh, when Xu Pei Pu was turned and became a spy, um, in in you know in the real story, um, and in the real story, the, the reason Julie's shaking her head is because uh, Borsico was a. Uh, much uh, lower ranking uh, mm. diplomat than he is in in either version of M. Butterfly because I wanted to use the sort of Madame Butterfly trope um, as um, a template for how I believe the West looks at the East even today, um, which meant that at that time, you have a French diplomat, you have, they're, they're in China, the issue would be Vietnam. Um, so Vietnam comes into the show as a manifestation of the West believing that the East wants to be controlled, wants to be dominated uh, on some level. And China had been dominated for many years since the end of the 19th century. Right. Now, Borico was, Bor Borsico Borsico. was eventually uh, tried for espionage, convicted, sentenced to prison, although he got a fairly short term. Do we know what happened to Shi Pei Pu? Um, Shi Pei Pu went back to China for a while. They were, so they were both convicted of espionage. Shi Pei Pu was deported, sent back to China, then made his way back to France and really lived in France with their child. Um, and that's a whole other story. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, it's part of our story. But um, it lived with their child until he passed away, um, maybe about 10 years ago now. The strangest part of the case was that uh, Boris Go always maintained that throughout their 20-year relationship, he was convinced that she was a woman. Did anyone believe him, or did most people think that he was gay but simply refusing to admit it or preferred to have people think he was stupid rather than that he no, was a homosexual? Well, this, is, this is the thing that we found very interesting in, in looking back at this, uh, the resource material which is that they met originally, not in David's version, as a man to a man. And then Shi uh, Pei Pu brought him, brought um, um, Borsico to the Peking Opera to see an opera called Butterfly Lovers, which ironically, there's another opera, it's, it's Chinese, called Butterfly Lovers, which is about a woman disguised as a man who falls in love with another young man. It's like a Shakespeare. And in, in Chinese theater, in men Ch always played women, as anyway, they did in Shakespeare. So this is what we found fascinating. Then, she, when when this young 
Chinese diva says to the Frenchman, that is my story. In fact, I was born a woman. The reason you're feeling this draw to me is because I was born a woman. My father and mother had two or three other sisters. I had three other sisters, and my father was told if they have another female child, then the mother, his mother will force him to marry someone else. So they raised me as a girl, and that is the way that I am now. So you're the only one who knows that I am truly a woman underneath these Mao suits. And this, this is something David and I found so contemporary without us having to fish for it, because these, these, this gender fluidity of you are what you believe you are. Now, could in casting, could you have cast that role with a woman playing I had part? a woman audition. We had transgender auditions. We had a, a wonderful um, actress audition. Yes, you can. You have a problem at the end with the nudity, which is, okay, are you going to strap on a prosthetic? Mm. Speaking of prosthetics, which I just heard, you know, <laughs> not four hours worth, but do you, do, you, do you do that and get rid of... Because nudity is very important at the end of this play, in both versions, I think. It has to be very honest and very exposed. So it's not that you couldn't do that, but it seemed like that was one more twist that we didn't need to do the first time out in this new version of David's play. I'm speaking with Julie Taymor and David Henry Huang uh, about the revival of M. Butterfly currently at the Court Theater on West 48th Street, starring Clive Owen and Jin Ha. Uh, now, you've changed the names, uh, so that gave you freedom, even in the original version, to... Uh, play with the themes and, and, and think about Madame Butterfly the Opera as well? Yeah, I mean, I think my, the, so 30 odd years ago when I f first th um, encountered the story, be because I knew very little about it, um, I basically just made everything up, which, you know, worked mm -hmm. out pretty well uh, uh, on its own terms. But um, I, I, so I never thought of that I was doing a docudrama. I always thought I was using this story and this mystery as a jumping off point to um, write about East and West and men and women and, and, and gender. Um, Madame Butterfly in the case uh, of uh, the Western male fantasy of a beautiful Asian woman falling deeply in love with a Westerner even though he treats her badly. Right, so at the time uh, um, I first thought about this, I thought, okay, well, what this diplomat think that he'd found? And the answer came to me, oh, he probably thought he'd found his version of Madame Butterfly. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the idea of dovetailing the events of the spy story and the plot of Madame Butterfly seemed like a really interesting way to get at the story. The play opens with Gallimard, your, Gallimard, your character in prison, saying, I have known and been loved by the perfect woman. So. We're seeing this story as it's filtered through his memory. Yes, um, and it's always been structured like that, although in the, my original intention was that, okay, you would have Gallimard, uh, the Frenchman, uh, be, control the narrative at the beginning of the show, and then there would be a struggle for the narrative between the two main characters, and that by the end of the play, the Chinese character would control the narrative. And I didn't really achieve that the first time out, but I feel like in this version, what we tried to do was bring out Sung's experience and the Chinese point of view more, and I think there is the, 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 the struggle for the narrative is much more present now. Well, I said there aren't going to be any spoilers during this conversation, but the play now includes graphic details about the couple's sex life, and we're not going to go into those, uh, into that right now. But they were included in the court transcripts. Yes. I mean, this is what we know. We, we don't have the court transcripts in French, but we have enough translation that David did an adaptation. And I think people always, even back then, would go, how did he not know? How could he not know? So even when you hear how um, the diva, the, the Chinese uh, diva, was able to allow him to believe that he was a woman, you still will have doubts. And, and it's perfectly possible what he said, because this is the beauty part, this is the part that moves me, uh, is that the fantasy of the love is more important than the reality. And I think people now with, just even with hideous fake news, you know, people know it's fake, but they'd rather believe it and live in that world that they've constructed, and we've allowed this to happen. So you're looking at a love story where these two men are truly happy when they're together in their cocoon of love. 
But their societies, whether it's the Chinese Communist Society says, you're a homosexual, you must repent, you must be re rehabilitated, or when they're in France and they're publicly humiliated by the press or the interrogation by the French court is as, is as cruel and as deep and as, as prurient as the Chinese interrogation is in the commune. These are the things that do not allow this unusual special relationship to flourish and to continue. So I think, I think that David happened upon a story that when, when we knew more about it, he was able to combine it with his strong interests, political interests, that are the East-West relationships. The original Broadway production star John Lithgow is a Gallimar, a man who by his own admission is socially awkward, especially around women, uh, the kind of role that John Lithgow does very well. Why'd you choose Clive Owen for this role? He's playing against his image as the, the handsome, self-assured movie star. Because that's what makes it interesting. Uh -huh. It's not fun to typecast exactly. That's, that's not, that's, oh, so what? Okay, I get it. I think John was great, and I love him, and he was a good Winston Churchill, too. <laughs> yes. But um, uh, I, I think that what was so great about Clive and what is wonderful in his performance is it, it's not about whether he looks awkward or is, um, you know, not everybody's uh, idea of the perfect physical specimen, but he himself is inadequate somehow and is constantly feeling that inadequacy as a man. He doesn't quite understand it from a very young age. And he's an ultra-romantic, and I have to say, Clive Owen is an ultra-romantic. Mm. And he was drawn to the part. And I think actors, look, Gary Oldman played against type as well, and I think all great actors are capable of doing so many different things that they're not cast for. And, and Clive pulls it off. And, and also, David got rid of things like, I was unattractive. Right, mm. you can't actually literally say line. unattractive. He can't but. say that. But the, I think uh, we do also play him as more of, a, of more of a striver, someone who comes from a more working class background, who's trying to kind of get into uh, a, a different vision of himself, and and that's a way that Clive works into the character very well. Song Li Ling was originally played by B. D. Wong, who won a Tony for it, became a star. Uh, didn't use the first name because it would you wanted that little bit of mystery about whether this was a man or a woman. Uh, now, Jin Ha is in the role. Isn't this his Broadway debut? It is. He just graduated, uh, I think, two years ago or so from NYU yeah. and went, was spirited off to Chicago to do Hamilton. And he was in the ensemble and understudied, apparently, Hamilton, Burr, and uh, George, King George. And when he auditioned for me, I just said, oh, please sing, sing the King George thing for me. And he went on, I believe, as all And these. he went on. Yeah. His last performance in Hamilton was as Hamilton. So the guy's really talented. Let's put it that way. He can sing opera. He studied opera. So he does sing from Puccini. And but here he you have Chinese opera. Well, we do both. Yeah, you, this you, is also yeah. very important. And, and in this version, you have two Chinese operas as well as the ele uh, elements from the Puccini. And we do the ballet, the Red Guard Ballet, um, the Red Detachment, Red Detachment of, of Women. women. Uh, how yeah. accurate is it? Well, accurate, we have to create our own Peking opera in three <laughs> minutes. So, And Elliot Goldenthal did the uh, score, and he said, you know, what took hundreds of years to do, he had to do in whatever amount of time. But we have a wonderful Chinese percussionist who has played two live Peking opera. And um, the choreographer. And the choreographer, Ma Kong. Ma Kong, is from China and grew up performing that dance. He did his own ballet. It's ballet. It's phenomenal. It's a, uh, it's, it yeah, once the, the they The Red got Detachment of Women, women part is a ballet. Yeah. But is a ballet. And so once they got rid of the Peking Opera, if you ever saw Farewell, My Concubine, you saw this mm -hmm. very well uh, depicted. They, they're wearing their green uniforms and with their rifles doing uh, what we would consider Western ballet. But it's inspired, obviously, from Russia. Now, M. Butterfly is currently on stage at the Court Theater at 138 West 48th Street. Is it an open run? I don't know. I think right now Clive is scheduled to the end of February, so that's how that goes. And then, so you better rush. You better rush, because he's amazing. Julie, um, and then we'll see. We'll see if we go on. And my great thanks to Julie Taymor, who directed, David Henry Huang, the playwright. Thank you for being on our show today. Thank you. Thanks for having us.
on tomorrow's Food Friday show, Melissa Clark, the New York Times food columnist, helps us prepare for Thanksgiving. And then we'll talk about a new program that helps young New Yorkers find work in the culinary industry with Greg Bishop, the program's creator, Chef Irv Malaver, the Director of Culinary Arts and Technology at the International Culinary Center, and Shervé Simeon, one of the program's graduates. Jonah Miller, a young chef who founded the restaurant Huertas, and Karen Savino, who profiled them in a new book called Generation Chef, and please explain is all about peppers with Maricel Priscilla. The Leonard Lopez Show is produced by Andres O'Hara, Melissa Millsop, and Topher Forges. Melissa Higgins, our executive producer. Matt Miranda was at the audio control, and so was Chase Colpon. And we had help today from Kate Guan, contributing producers Barbara Kahn and Deborah Freeman. I'm Leonard Lopez, your host. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.